Hello and most welcome to 1429 of the series. We will today read from a book by Paul Johnston, Wittgenstein, Rethinking the Inner. This is an association what we gone through earlier. We've been speaking about outside, inside. Exogenous, endogenous. Mind, matter. Up, down, to use a Heraclitian phrase. Heidegger went really deep into these things and I will start to read directly from the book and then some comments. The problem of the inner, the expression, who knows what is going on inside him. The interpretation of outer events <clears throat> as consequences of unknown or merely surmised inner ones. The interest that is focused on the inner as if on the chemical structure from which behavior issues. One needs only to ask, what do I care about inner events? Whatever they are, to see that a different attitude is conceivable. But surely everyone 
will always be interested in his own inner life. Nonsense. I know that pain, etc., etc. Was something in there if I weren't told so? End of quote. The concept of the inner is both familiar and mysterious. Lying at the heart of all our psychological concepts, it is invoked whenever we wonder what is going on inside someone's head or try to assess exactly what lies behind a particular look or smile. But what exactly is the inner? Where, for example, is it located? Here we encounter a difficulty.
it is clear that the inner is not literally inside the individual. And yet, it would make little sense to locate it, it somewhere outside her. The attempt to describe the contents of the inner creates further problems. Consciousness seems an ever-shifting mass of fleeting experiences. And it seems impossible that words should ever capture it. Even in the case of a particular experience, the task seems little easier for here, too, one is tempted to say that the only way to know the experience is to have it. Thus, although inner experience is the very essence of human life, it seems impossible to describe or define it. What we feel and think seems inherently private, knowable only to the individual herself. But this suggestion has the implausible implication that Communication Furthermore, the individual seem inexorably drawn into solipsism
for is not the world of consciousness the only one she really knows. And is not that world exclusively hers, an inner realm into which no one else can ever gain admittance? These questions and a host of related ones lie at the heart of Wittgenstein's later work. Having himself come close to solipsism in the early 1930s, He spent nearly 20 years struggling to come to grips with the problem of the inner. And as he did so, he developed a radically new approach to psychological concepts one which challenges both traditional ways of thinking and more recent ideas. Before we look directly at Wittgenstein's claims, however, it is important to grasp exactly what it is about the inner that makes it so problematic. One way of doing this is to consider certain oddities about psychology, the science which studies the inner. As Wittgenstein noted in his final lecture series at Cambridge, the most striking of these is that the psychologist can never directly 
observe the phenomena she is supposedly studying. All she can actually observe are the manifestations of the inner, not the inner itself. The alternative and the only means for direct access would be introspection. But this is even more problematic. First, it would involve a circularity. To observe thinking, for example, one would have to already have to know what it is. Secondly, the results of any such inquiry would immediately be, be questionable. For why should one person's conclusions hold for everybody? For example, if someone says she always has an image when she thinks, this may be true of her, but would not necessarily apply to everyone else and their thinking. A final problem is the difficulty of separating the act of observing the experience from the act of having it.
If you go about to observe your own mental happenings, If you go about to observe your own mental happenings, you may alter them and create new ones. And the whole point of observing is that you should not do this. Thus, it seems impossible to study the inner, either from the outside or from the out inside. The science of mental phenomena has this puzzle. I can't observe the mental phenomena of others and I cannot observe my own in the proper sense of observe. As these remarks illustrate, there seems to be something peculiarly elusive about thinking and about the inner in general. Baffled by this elusiveness, we may be tempted to fall back on the idea that the inner consists of specific but indescribable experiences known to the individual through her own personal acquaintances with them. But what sense does this conception really make?
The first problem with it is the clash between the notion of privacy and the fact that we can and do discuss our feelings and experiences If our inner worlds are in principle inaccessible to others, how is it that we still manage to discuss them? The natural answer is that our words offer a picture or translation of our thoughts. Although our inner world is private, it can nevertheless be represented in a way comprehensible to others. At first, this idea seems implausible Plausible, sorry, for we do indeed talk of trying to put our thoughts into words and of trying to find precisely the right word to capture our meaning.
but how can we translate something the other person cannot possibly know into terms which she is supposed to understand. How can the other person make a connection between the word and some object which must of necessity remain perpetually hidden to her? Furthermore, is it really the case that there is a process of comparison and translation every time someone says what she thinks? As these questions suggest, understanding the inner and in particular its relevance. Its relation to language is not as straightforward as it might first appear. Although the idea that we translate our thoughts into words seem self-evident, pinning down this process seems much more difficult. In fact, Wittgenstein argues 
that the very idea of translation makes no sense. His first point is that it is only makes sense to talk of translation. If it is possible to distinguish between accurate and inaccurate accounts. In the case of translating thoughts into words, however, this creates a difficulty for if the individual's inner world is ex hypothesi inaccessible to others, how can the accuracy of her translation be checked. The natural response is to say that the individual can check it herself. But what does this actually mean? Suppose she finds a mistake. How can she be sure that her second translation is more accurate than her first? Maybe she only thinks she made an error. Or maybe neither of her translations is correct and some third version is the true one. The problem is that in her search for correctness, the individual never reaches further, firmer ground. Each of her statements is only backed up by her belief that it is correct, so that intrinsically all are on the same level. Faced with a number of possible translations, the individual can only adjudicate between them in terms of which strike her as 
correct at these particular moments. Here we straddled on to a whole quagmire of problems, a maelstrom of how we know the correctness, how do we compare with earlier thoughts. How can we even know what we are? thinking. And when I think something, that thinking is similar in another person. And trying to use language to say it's the same thinking simply doesn't work because how do we know how someone else checks his words? As all exams of Wittgenstein, they are incredibly rigorous. I don't think it is an exaggeration to say that no thinker before him has even pondered about these things. This is somewhat similar to the much later Gibsonian affordance.
but whereas the Gibsonian affordance is a solution to a problem that erupted within neurology and psychology. Wittgenstein goes much deeper. It is not inner or outer. Neither are we talking about both. It is much more complex than that. <sighs> I wonder if Wittgenstein didn't see this either or or both as a non-understanding and that the relation between inner and outer is much more complex than this simple oversimplified recipe for how it works. Could it be that either or or both sort of stops our entering our thinking deeper into these things? I think the last year I have come to see the struggle between idealism and materialism not as a proper struggle but two ways of not understanding. Either path is trying to use contradiction in an illicit manner. And thereby affecting thinking itself as a movement, making it dumb and numb. Maybe making it self into a copy of the left hemisphere take it 
doesn't make deeper, why not fractal understanding possible? There is a major difference here. Fractality is not focusing on what is nor on what is not. It is the complex and hard to grasp border between the two. The Lichtung to make an Heideggerian phrase work within this area. The Lichtung is what it ha where it happens, and the Lichtung is a movement. It's clearly from when we look how the guesswork that makes up a fractal set creates the moving feature that is also stasis. And when you think of it, why would it be so simple that we, without a doubt, can say what is inner and outer in every case? Can we, with, with only few exceptions, say it? Or is it the opposite, which I think? Only in very rare exceptional cases we can tell whether something is inner and or outer. Remember the example in philosophical investigations where two people is cementing a wall and using a slate. To say that the slate is inner or outer, that it is a thought or it's an object out there, is a misuse of language in that case. It's not understanding how words really work in the language game. Those are weird and illicit questions, almost like asking, what is inner? It's like saying, what is a table if you have one in front of you?
and me using it for years. I wouldn't say that Wittgenstein offers a solution. He offers something much more. An opening of a door to an incredibly interesting world. Where things are not labeled psychic or material. Good old Ian McKilchrist had a fantastic point when he said when people try to reduce knowledge understanding to matter they have no idea that matter is the most unknown thing of all and that it is not easier or less complex than the inner and that makes reductionism even more ignorant it is it's like trying to understand something that we don't know about it's something that we we'll know even less about. <laughs> Imagine that as learning a language. That you use words you have no idea in that language to say that those corresponds to other words in that language. Without knowing by using them, any of their meaning. It just doesn't make any sense. It is not even wrong. And that is the misunderstanding I think Heidegger is pointing to. Why, thank you very much. We will dwell deeper into this matter in the next 1430. Excellent writer, I would say, Paul Johnston. <laughs>